So we're continuing our re-series that we're having through January. When you put the prefix re in in front of a word, it means new again or fresh or once more. So to be renewed is to be made new again. To be refreshed is to be made fresh again. To be restored is to be brought back to an original store condition, just like a new one. To remember is to bring back to memory or to bring back to mind something from the past once more. Anyone here have trouble with their memory? Come on, anyone just already, already this year, you've, uh, you've got up out of your chair to go to another room to do something that was really important, but when you got to that other room, you totally forgot what it was you were going to do. Who's experienced that already this year? We forget. We forget the important thing, or maybe you've been sent by your spouse to the shops to buy that really important thing. There's just one thing desperately needed for dinner. By the time you get home from the shops, you've got bagfuls of things that you've bought. You've been to Bunnings and Rebel and, you know, all sorts of places. But as you walk through the doors, you remember you actually forgot the one thing that you were sent to the shops to get. Or maybe this morning as you drive home from church, you remember to stop and to pick up some uh, nappies for the kids or you remember to stop and pick up lunch for the kids or you remember to stop and get those things that the kids need for school in about uh, a week's time or you think, man, it's hot, I'm going to be number one parent. You remember to stop and and buy the kids ice creams uh, for lunch but then you remember that you actually forgot to stop and pick up your kids from Kids Zone. And they're still at church. You've remembered all this other stuff, but you've forgotten the thing that was most important. You've forgotten the one thing that you really needed to remember. You see, we easily, you know, we easily forget the one thing that is most important when we get distracted by many things that are somewhat important. This is true in our lives, and we need to remember because we easily forget what is most important, the one thing that is most important, when we get distracted by many things that are somewhat important. Now, if there is, if there is one thing that's most important, it's important that we remember what that thing is. Just uh, have a listen to some of Curly's wisdom on the screen. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. Incredibly profound and, uh, and really not that helpful. You've you got to figure out what that one thing is. For yourself. Now, that's not true in the church. Jesus has actually made it really clear what that one thing is. But we easily forget what that one thing is when we get distracted by many things that are somewhat important. That's what had happened to a church in Ephesus that uh, 2,000 years ago, church like us, just ordinary people trying to work out how to follow Jesus, and uh, they'd forgotten in the midst of many things that they were doing that were important. They got distracted. They were doing many good things and Jesus noticed it. But they got distracted and they forgot the one thing that was most important. I'm going to read a letter that Jesus wrote to them, and it's a letter that uh, I I reckon we often kind of read it and we picture Jesus with a stick in his hand. He's kind of wanting to get us. He's kind of, he's cranky with us, and he wants us to, he wants us to do the right thing, and the way he's going to do it is to threaten us with a stick. Now, there are consequences in this letter that I'm going to read, but I, I actually think we read this a little bit wrong. 
I actually think when Jesus is writing this letter, he's not so much got a stick in his hand, but he's got this burning desire in his heart. He actually writes it with longing and desire for his people. And it's in the book of Revelation, and it's a book that's often uh, very much misunderstood, probably the most misunderstood book of the New Testament. It's written with a lot of, uh, of vivid imagery and symbolic language. But right at the beginning of the book, there's some very normal letters written to, to churches full of normal people like you and me. And one of the reasons that Revelation is so misunderstood is that what I see is that some people try and teach that some of the vivid uh, imagery and symbolic language in uh, the book of Revelation is, is actually depicting you know, a literal event that's going to happen. And the literal letters that are written to actual churches are read as symbolic language, as periods of, you know, time through history that all revolves around America. And, uh, and so the book of Revelation gets, gets completely misunderstood. Th these letters at the beginning, I'm only going to read one of them today, is written to a literal church. A, a church just, just like us, trying to work out how to follow Jesus. And this church is uh, the church in Ephesus. It's a church that... Uh, that were known for their love for God and for each other. But as the years rolled by, they got distracted by many things. And, and they'd lost the one thing that was most important. In the midst of the many things that they were doing that were good, they lost the one thing that was most important. Jesus dictates this letter to, uh, to the Apostle John to give to the church in uh, Ephesus and he begins by encouraging them for what they've done. And I, I really believe that Jesus wants to encourage you for what you've done this morning. Let, let me read Revelation chapter 2. It says, Write this to the angel of the church in the city of Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven lights made of gold. That's Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's that one. He says this, I know what you have done and how hard you have worked. That's a pretty big deal. Je Jesus commends them for their hard work. And I would say to all of you here this morning who have served faithfully in the church, Jesus commends you for your hard work. He does. He, he notices your hard work. He, he notices what you have done to serve him in the church and beyond, and he likes it. He, he commends you for it. Now, you've got to understand, you know, if you think that uh, when you serve in the church behind the scenes that no one notices, if you think that no one notices the, the sacrifice of time and money that you give to see God's purposes uh, realized in the church, if you think that, that, that no one has noticed the, the prayers that you have prayed and the way that you've just poured out your life on behalf of others, if you think that no one has noticed, you're wrong. The God of heaven and earth notices. He commends you for your hard work. That there hasn't been one, one late night at youth group on a Friday night when you're cleaning up after all the mess the kids have made that, that, that hasn't gone unnoticed. You know, there hasn't been one never-ending elders meeting that has gone unnoticed. There hasn't been one early morning music practice or early morning, you know, kids ministry, uh, getting everything ready to serve the kids of this church. There hasn't been one moment that Jesus hasn't noticed your hard work and he commends you for it. Now you've got to understand, the one who notices and commends you for your hard work, he's the one that put the sun in its place and threw stars into space. You know, he's the one that could actually part a Red Sea and enable a whole nation to be uh, set free from slavery. He's the one who left the comfort of heaven to come to earth and to heal the sick and to care for the poor and to feed the hungry. He's the one who's done those kind of good works. He's the one who's made the ultimate sacrifice to actually 
to put to death on a cross to forgive all of mankind their sins. He's that one. That God notices your hard work and he commends you for it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus notices your hard work and he notices your perseverance. He notices when you persevere through hardship. You know, in verse 3, it says, You've persevered and you've endured hardships for my name and you have not grown weary. I commend you for it. Now, we need to be reminded this morning that following Jesus will not be easy. I think in this Western world that we live in, we need to be constantly reminded of this fact. Following Jesus will take hard work. Following Jesus will be a sacrifice. Following Jesus, there will be hardships. I regularly have people come to me, people of all ages and all walks of life, and say, you know, we've stepped out in faith to do what God was calling us to do. We felt like we stepped out in faith to serve in this particular way. And it's been really hard. You know, things have gone wrong. People have come against us. You know, it's been difficult financially. You know, we've just faced these hardships as we've stepped out in faith to follow Jesus. Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe, maybe we didn't hear God right. Maybe, you know, we had the right heart, but we've done the wrong thing. And that's why life is really hard. I don't know what Bible you're reading if you're thinking that following Jesus and serving his purposes on the earth is supposed to be easy. I mean, read about the life of Paul. I mean, read, read about the life of Jesus. And Jesus himself, just before he died, promised that life wouldn't be easy. John 16, he says, in this world you will have what? Say it again, in this world you will have? trouble but but take heart i've overcome the world but it's going to be hard you know jesus looks at the the people in ephesus and they had endured hardship they they lived in a culture where caesar was lord and you were supposed to worship caesar the whole community the whole culture you know revolved around caesar being Lord, Caesar having power. And so to declare that Jesus Christ is actually Lord, that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, it actually meant, if you persisted in doing that in this culture, it meant hardship. It, it, it meant that you were going to lose friends. It meant that you were going to lose finances. It meant that you were going to lose freedom. You were going to lose family. You were going to lose privilege. And they, these people have been through this for years. They'd faced hardship because they continued to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. And Jesus noticed. And he commends them for it. And I reckon there's a whole bunch of us here this morning. In fact, I know there's a whole bunch of us here this morning who have endured hardship because of your faith in Jesus, because of the way you serve Jesus, because of the way you've chosen to step out in faith and fulfill Jesus' purposes. You've faced hardship. For some of you, it's financial hardship. For, for others, it's been relational hardship. Some of you have faced very real persecution. There's been hardship, but you haven't given up. You know people who have given up. You know people who aren't sitting in the pews anymore with you because it got hard. But you haven't given up. And Jesus notices. He notices your hard work and he notices the way that you persevere through hardship and he commends you for it. And he notices. He notices the way that the church in Ephesus have preserved the gospel. If you read on in verse 2, it says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, 
that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you've found them false. Then he goes on in verse 6 to say, you hate the practices, not the people, but the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He says, you've got to understand, church in Ephesus in the first century, they don't have the Bible yet. They don't have the scriptures to read. And so the apostles were coming and teaching the word of the Lord. And over the decades, some other, some teachers had, you know, decided to elevate themselves to apostleship and were turning up in Ephesus. And you couldn't check on Facebook. You couldn't check all their credentials. You just had to take them at face value. They were coming into the church and they're saying, I'm an apostle. I'm here to teach the gospel. Except they were teaching a gospel which was Jesus plus. It was kind of like Jesus was mixed in there, but plus a whole bunch of other stuff. And, and they were looking at their lives and seeing, you know, these, these people don't seem to be living very godly lives. They were either out for money or they were, they were, out to, they were, they were abusive uh, towards uh, women and, and marriages. They weren't living godly lives. And, and the church in Ephesus had listened to what they're teaching and had watched their lives and had worked out who was preaching the gospel and who wasn't. And Jesus notices that and he commends them for it. He says, you've preserved the gospel. You've tested those who claim to be apostles and aren't. Really important, particularly when you don't have the scriptures finished yet. I reckon it's really important for us in this generation too. Sadly, I, I see too many messages in the church in Australia which diminish the power of the gospel, which diminish the centrality of Jesus as Lord and Saviour, which is speaking other messages of, of helping and other positive messages of the way you know, God wants to bless. and you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of messages out there and they're not all completely bad. But what I see in this, this culture that we live in that values tolerance over truth, there's this temptation in the church to constantly water down the gospel, to diminish the death and the resurrection of Jesus as the message and the only message and the only way to be saved. I think we have an important job as a church in this generation to preserve the gospel, to keep the gospel all about Jesus, to keep Jesus central in everything that we say and everything we do. And he says, he says, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. They sound evil, don't they, Nicolaitans? Those evil Nicolaitans. They kind of were pretty bad. You know, Ephesus was known for its idol worship, its worship of Diana, who was a sex goddess. And it, was, it was known for its sexual immorality. And so the, the Nicolaitans were, were preaching a message that said, well, their worship practice was, you know, let's have a big barbecue and eat lots of meat sacrificed to idols and then have sex with lots of people. That was their worship practice. And that was the practice that the church in Ephesus hated. And says, that's not godly. That's not who the church is called to be. Essentially, the Nicolaitans' message was, come to church, worship Jesus on Sunday, do whatever you like the rest of the week. Because as long as we're spiritual on Sunday, it doesn't matter what we do with our body the rest of the week. And the church in Ephesus says, no, that's not the message of Jesus. They preserved the gospel. Jesus notices and he commends them for it. Here was a church that were working hard for Jesus, a church that persevered through hardship for Jesus, and a church that preserved the gospel of Jesus. Jesus notices and he commends them for it. I believe Jesus will commend you for it this morning. There's a whole bunch of you that need to take a hold of this encouragement from Jesus and realize that he notices what you've done and he commends you. He encourages you. Then Jesus says, I have this one thing against you. And it's actually the most important thing. 
in the midst of all the many good things that you've done, I've got this one thing against you in verse 4. You do not love me as you first did. I got this one thing against you. You do not love me as you first did. 25 years earlier, Paul had written to this same church and he commended them for their faith and for their love for God and for one another. But a generation later, Jesus is now writing them another letter and saying, you've forgotten something really important. You've forgotten your first love. Your passionate relationship with me has become a lifeless ritual that they'd not given up on the object of their love. They were still following Jesus. They were still sitting in church every week, but they'd lost their zeal. They'd lost their their single-minded devotion. They'd lost their passionate and intimate love for their Savior and for their King. And so Jesus says, remember, as I said, I don't reckon he's doing it with a stick. I reckon he's doing it with longing and desire in his heart. Remember how you once loved me. Do you, do you remember when you first fell in love with your wife or your husband, your girlfriend, your boyfriend? Some of you got to think back decades. Some of you got to think back last night. But you know, just, just think back. Remember when you first fell in love and you just wanted to be with that person all the time. There was nothing you wouldn't do for them. You just couldn't wait to see them again. When you had to say goodbye, you couldn't wait to see them again. I remember as a 19-year-old falling head over heels in love with Susan. And I remember sitting in her driveway for hours talking. I mean, I can barely talk for 10 minutes, you know, one-on-one these days. But uh, back then, man, we just sit there for hours talking. I just loved being with her. I wanted to, to, to get to know her. I, I'd sit there till one in the morning and back then I had to be at work at six. I didn't care. I just wanted to be with her. I wanted to get to know her. In fact, the only reason I eventually went home is that her dad after midnight would come out and just start flicking the light on on the porch. Eventually I worked out it was Morse code for get your hands off my daughter and go home, you young punk. That, that was the Morse code. And, and so I did, but I didn't want to. I wanted to be with her. But as the years go by, you've got to decide to keep that kind of love alive. Back then, no one needed to tell me to schedule a date night in my calendar. I wanted to be with her every night. No one needed to remind me to write her a love letter every now and again and and tell her how much she means to me. I was writing letters. I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to be with her. I wanted to get to know her. I wanted to kiss her. I wanted to be close to her. But to keep that kind of love alive in a marriage... You've got to decide to do it. You've got to decide to have date nights. You've got to decide to sit and talk. You've got to decide to write love letters. You've got to decide that you want to keep that kind of love alive and fresh. And you've got to be active in doing it. And this church in Ephesus hadn't been. They were going through the motions. They still believed in orthodox theology but their relationship with God had lost its heart. You know, I've performed a lot of weddings over the years. I've, I've stood in this very spot, in fact, and I've, I've performed scores of weddings. And every time, you know, I, I see the bride walking down the aisle and the groom is standing right next to me, And it's either one of two things. Either he's smiling so hard, it looks like the veins are going to burst out of his head. Or or he's sweating and crying so much that there's a pool of kind of water around him here on the stage. He's looking at his bride walking towards him and he's just overwhelmed with love. 
And then the bride starts to walk up these stairs and the the two of them come together. And and you can't hear this, but I can. They're, They're saying things like, I love you so much. You're so beautiful. Oh, this is so good. And I feel like saying, pull yourself together, people. And the two of them, they got tears and snot going everywhere. Rachel told me Ben was exactly like that just last Saturday. Tears, snot, just... And I often, I often say to the groom, say, you're a lucky man. You've got a beautiful bride. Never in 23 years of doing weddings has that groom looked back at me and said, she's all right, I suppose. Not bad. Better than average. Not once. He he normally can't get words out, but the groom's standing there. He's going, no, I'm so lucky. His tongue's hanging out of his head. He's hungry for his bride. He just loves her and wants to be with her. Now, when Jesus thinks about the kind of relationship he wants us to understand that we have with him. What's the relationship he picks? What's the metaphor he chooses? He says, I am the bridegroom and you, the church, are my bride, my pure, spotless bride. My bride that I love with an everlasting love. You know, when Jesus is thinking about, you know, what's the relationship that will help them understand the kind of relationship I want them to have, he doesn't choose a ho-hum, mediocre, average kind of relationship. He doesn't say, you are like my mother-in-law. You know, you're kind of handy to have around to look after the kids, but then just please go home. He doesn't pick any mothers-in-law out there, don't start looking at your son-in-law, but that's what they're thinking. And <laughs> he doesn't pick that kind of relationship. He picks the most passionate, intimate relationship that he can think of. He says, I am a bridegroom and the church is my bride. I'm passionately in love with you. Passionately and intimately, I want to know you. These Ephesians, they've worked hard. I know many here have worked very hard for the sake of the gospel. They would persevered through hardship. And I know that that could be said for many of you here in this room. There are times you attempted to walk away from honouring God and you didn't. And Jesus notices and he commends you for it. And they would preserved the gospel. They, they had an orthodox theology. They, they kind of, they, they believed something, even though they had pressure around them not to believe it, not to preserve the gospel as being all about Jesus. They held on to it and they preserved it for the next generation. And as I said, I believe it's a really important thing for us to do as a church in this generation. And Jesus notices and commends them for it. But they had forgotten the most important thing. They'd forgotten their first love. I want you just to remember again this morning. Think back to when you first loved God. Or maybe when you first discovered that God loved you and sent his son Jesus to die for you. Or think back to when you were first filled with the Holy Spirit and you just, you just knew the, the, the power and the presence of God in you. For some of you, you'll be thinking back to when you're a child and you just had a, like a childlike joy. Some of you will be thinking back to when you're a teenager and there was just this burning passion in you for Jesus. Some of you will be thinking back to when you're, you're middle-aged, you're, you're an adult, but you discovered Jesus and it's kind of like, oh, it was just like coming home. It was just transformed your life. It was like the pieces just started to, to, to fall into place and you just couldn't believe you were so loved. But whenever it was for you, think back, remember. Remember your first love. 
Is there that same hunger and passion in you for the presence of Jesus today? Or has it diminished somewhat? And I reckon we all might have some excuses ready to go. You know, I'm busy. I've got other pressures in my life now. Some of you will say, people in the church have hurt me. It's really impacted my relationship with God. Others of you, you make excuses like, that was youthful zeal back then. That was just me being young. My life is different now. You'll notice in this passage and no other passage in the New Testament does Jesus give us the option of making excuses or blaming others or writing it off as youthful zeal. Never. Jesus says, remember. I want you to remember. I want you to bring back to memory once more how you first loved me. Be sorry for your sin and love me again as you did at first. There's three re-words in here. First one's remember, bring back to mind the way you once loved. The second one is repent. And we often think of the word repentance as God with a stick. But repent, repentance is turning back to God when we've been turning our affections towards something else. And God always wants us to repent because he's got something better for us. He says, remember, repent, and return. Come back to that place where you just loved being in my presence. That is the best place for you to be. Have you noticed these days... And it's a growing phenomenon. It seems to be every shop I walk into now, they ask me, do I have a rewards card when I go to make a purchase? And, and I decide there at the counter whether I'm ever coming back to this shop again. You know, I, I bought Susan a, a candle for Christmas and the lady at dusk said, are you a, are you a rewards member here? And I said to her, do I look like a rewards member? And she says, no, you're not, not our usual clientele. But uh, I didn't want a rewards card. I, I wasn't going to give any more of my love and attention to a candle shop. But the rewards cards that we do accept, they tell us something about what we love. They tell us something about what we do give our time and attention, our money, our love to. And I took my life into my own hands uh, this week and I went rifling through Susan's purse and I found all of her rewards cards. Actually, this pile here is only half of them. But it tells us what she loves. Coffee. She's got a rewards card from our local coffee shop because she loves coffee. She's got a rewards card from Woolworths, from Coles and from Ralph's, which is a grocery store in America. She loves groceries. She's got a hog's breath frequent diner card. She loves curly fries. She's got a Jeans West and a Just Jeans rewards card. She keeps eating those curly fries. She will not fit into those jeans any longer. She, she is a Priceline sister. She loves cheap cosmetics, apparently. She's a Velocity frequent flyer, a Qantas frequent flyer. She's got a Flybys card. She loves flying. She's got a uh, BCF card and a Rebel Sport card because she loves her husband. She has an RACQ Gold Member Awards card because her husband always gets lost in the bush and we never leave home without it. She's got a Wallace Bishop Gold Card Member because her husband really loves her and is always buying her jewellery. Uh, she has, this is my favourite, she's got a Patty Moore's Meats Red Meat Rewards card in her purse. I knew I married this girl for a reason. She loves buying red meat. She's got, I didn't even know this existed. I didn't even know she bought linen, but she's got a Linen Lovers Rewards card from Adairs. 
I, I, I thought we'd been sleeping on the sh- same sheets for the last 23 years, but apparently not. She, she gets, she's a lover of linen. She's got priority club rewards, priority guest rewards, Amelia Hotel rewards. She loves staying in hotels. And she's got a Queensland Baptist registered minister rewards card. You get straight to heaven with one of these cards. <laughs> you see, we, we take rewards cards because we love what they represent. We, we want to give it some of our time, some of our attention, some of our love, some of our money. And we love the benefits we get in return. We love the reward that we get, so we carry these things around. Now, this is the problem. I reckon we can easily treat Jesus like just another reward card that we slot into the pile. He's just another thing that we give some of our time, some of our attention, some of our love, some of our money to, and we appreciate the rewards. I think our lives can get so busy and so distracted with so many things we love We just find a way to conveniently and comfortably slip Jesus in here so we're definitely going to get the reward that he offers. Now the problem is, that's not what Jesus invites us into. Jesus never says, let me conveniently and comfortably just slip into your life along with everything else. He doesn't say, you know, you can, you know, just love me like you love coffee and jeans and traveling and all of the other things in life and just hang around till you get a reward. Jesus is a bit different to that. Colossians chapter 1, it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. You see, Jesus is the King of kings. He's the center of all things. Everything in this world and everything in our lives revolves around Him. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the firstborn over all creation. He holds all things together in His hand. Everything in this world is made for Him and for His glory. It's all about him. He is the most important one in the universe. It's all about Jesus. Can I hear an amen for that? Now, Jesus loves to reward you. Don't get me wrong, there's incredible benefits from being a follower of Jesus. If you read on in that passage in Colossians 1, It says that that Jesus, the Supreme One, went to a cross to die for our sins, to, to, to bring us into a place of peace with God. He shed His blood on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven, we could know a relationship with God for all of eternity. There's an eternal reward when you put your faith in Jesus. As Tim's read out before, when you put your faith in Jesus, we get this incredibly undeserved gift of grace and forgiveness in our lives. We are washed clean. We're at peace with God. We'll get to spend eternity with God. It's an incredible reward. Don't think that Jesus doesn't want to reward you. He does. But when he's asked what is the most important thing, now what is this life here on earth all about? As Curly said, what is the secret to life? 
He says this one thing. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Love others in the same way. He says, all of the law and the prophets hang off this. Everything, everything comes from this. This is what your life is all about. Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul and strength and love others in the same way. That's the one thing. That's the most important thing. But that's the very thing that we forget when we get distracted by many things that are somewhat important. You know, the church in Ephesus, they worked hard, they persevered, they preserved the gospel. Jesus was still a part of their life. They'd slotted him in with all the other things. They hadn't given up on Jesus. They still believed the right things. They were still getting their reward. They were still going to spend eternity with God because of their faith in Christ. But they'd forgotten the most important thing. And Jesus says to them, I want you to remember how you once loved me. Repent. Be sorry for your sin. Turn around. Return to a place of just worship, a place of passion, a place of intimacy, a place where we look to Jesus as the ruler of all things, the lover of our soul, the one that everything else in this world and in our lives revolves around. Remember when you used to love me like that, with an overwhelming kind of love? Do that again. Do that once more. Do that afresh. And I tell you, Jesus is saying that with longing and desire in his heart because he just loves having that kind of relationship with you. He knows what a blessing it will be to you. I reckon God is saying to some of you today, I've seen your hard work. I've seen you persevere through hardship. I've seen you hold on to the truth of the gospel when there's temptations to water it down. But this one thing, I have against you. Remember how you once loved me. That's what I want again. Repent of your sin. Return to me with all of your heart. Let me pray. Father God, I do thank you. I thank you that you always have longing and desire in your heart. Even when you give us a hard word, a challenging word, a convicting word, God, you just love us so much. You just love us being in a place of intimacy with you, passion with you, a place where we give you all the glory. God, we thank you. Thank you for this invitation. God, by your Spirit this morning, would you help us to accept this invitation? to remember our first love, to love you as we did right in the beginning. God, right now, God, would you be helping us to remember, helping us to remember just what it was like to be overwhelmed, overwhelmed with love for you, just wanting to be with you and to get to know you, spend time with you. God, would you call us Call us back to that place. Bring back to memory that relationship. Bring us back to that place with you, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a really simple song. It just says, I love you, Lord. God, I love you. Maybe this morning as we sing these words, you might need to make up your own words. You might, I just, I just believe God is just wanting to just 
to fill you with an overwhelming love. He's wanting to bring you to a place of just loving Him for who He is, releasing you into worship, releasing you to enjoy Him. You might need to make up your own words, but just begin this morning just to pour out, pour out your love for God. Tell Him you love Him. There's a whole bunch of you this morning. You need us to get down the front here. But today's a day of repentance. And as I said, repentance is a good thing. It's a day to turn back to God and say, Jesus, bring me back. I want to be back in that place of just wholehearted devotion to you. You know some of the things that are getting in the way. You need to push to the side and let those things revolve around Jesus, not Jesus revolve around the things in your life. Some of you just need to come to the front, just kneel as we sing this song. Just come and stand, sing this song. I'm going to have someone just pray for you gently. Just pray that God will fill your heart with a first love. Just come when you're ready. Come on, there's a bunch of you need to be down here. Just come. Just come as we sing.